Um, and let's discuss. We're going to talk about dew points today and uh, a, a rather unique technology that allows us to, uh, to do dew point analysis um, from a company called ZGAS Instruments out of Maryland. And um, in case you guys have any hard questions, I think I saw that both Saurabh and Miriam from ZGAS are on today. So if it gets tough, I'm just going to bail and pass it over to them. Um, for any of you who've been on some of our webinars recently, you know, I've often been starting them off a little bit of the same way of talking about how, you know, in our industry, it's really common for us to, um, to start off meetings with a safety moment, which of course is important to our industry. But I think with all the things that have been going on in the world, how difficult business has become, changes we have had, things that have happened climate-wise for our friends down in Texas and place like that. Um, I think it's always important to start these off with a bit of a gratitude moment and some of the things that we're thankful for. And so for the webinar this week, I want to reach out a little bit or give a thanks out to those healthcare workers who have been involved in this whole transition that's been going on, watching everything in their industry change and trying to figure out how to handle people coming in for checkups, coming into hospitals, the uncertainty of them, and also putting themselves a lot of personal risk. So again, I'd like to just uh, like to start these out a little bit for some of the things that we're grateful for. And one of the things hospitals, so those brave souls have been working pretty hard try to keep us all safe and healthy. Doesn't matter whether you agree with the whole shutting down of business, which I don't personally agree with, but uh, you know, I mean, these people have really been, have had to put it out there and uh, I think they deserve some gratitude from us. Um, so today we are gonna talk about, uh, primarily about Ziga's instruments and their dew point analyzers. But uh, I guess I always start this off a little bit about who Insight is, how we fit into the picture and what we do. And then, like I say, the majority of this, we're going to be talking about dew point analysis, about what is dew point, why do we end up hitting dew points in pipelines or in analyzer systems when we don't expect to, methods or, or the method that is employed in the Z-Gas analyzer is a rather unique and patented one. So I'd like to talk a little bit about SEERS and how it works, and then talk about some of the things we can do analytically and some of the applications at the end. And Phil, can I just mention that if anybody has any questions, feel free to come off mute and ask Phil, or you can type it in the chat and either Scott or Jessica or Chris is now here, we'll um, read your question out for Phil. Yeah, I usually tell people I got three kids, I get interrupted all the time. And so if you want to just jump in with a question, feel free. Um, so a bit about Insight. Uh, as mentioned, we're a Calgary-based systems integrator, distributor. We do some product development here as well. So one of the big things we're going to see coming up is a couple of webinars about some of the innovations that we're trying to come up with on the sampling side of things as well. Uh, we operate out of a 20,000 square foot facility, nine bay doors, big 10 ton overhead crane. We can do full analyzer buildings that pick them up with the crane, drop them down into the building. Uh, for the Canadians, we're an AB83 compliant fabrication facility. So one of the things in Canada is this thing called CRN or Canadian registration numbers. For Europeans, that's similar to the pressure equipment directive. Um, for Americans, it follows a lot very closely with ASME 31.3. So it's just a set of regulations around how we handle pressure vessels and the like. Canada has some neat things and we've done unique things and we've done systems, like I say, for Alberta, BC, Ontario, Saskatchewan. Uh, a lot of the people here are people I have known for a long time. I've come along in the business and I've, I've seen how they worked and, and liked how they worked and brought them on board. So we have a great team for working with engineering companies, strong documentation capabilities, uh, great drafting. My drafting guy, one of my drafting people has been with us or in the analyzer business doing analyzer shelters and drawings for about 35 years now. So a lot of experience and just kind of, you know, kind of a practical approach to getting things done. Uh, all our electrical is done journeyman electricians. Uh, we do full factory acceptance tests right here in Calgary. On the, uh, the integration side, we uh, have full systems integration uh, capabilities, everything from custom sample systems to process analyzer integration, to PLC and automation systems, and, and then to full analyzer buildings. We'll work on projects right from the feed stage. So we're doing a couple right now where we're looking at 
you know, what type of technology should be used, how would it be implemented, what kind of sample systems you need. We'll go right through detail engineering, design, uh, fabrication, commissioning, and of course, field service. Everything that we uh, sell, we like to try to service. Be a little bit tougher with COVID and some of the products because it's harder to get down to factories for training. And so we're having to do a lot more things remotely, but um, all of that uh, becomes a big part of really how we approach the business, which is try to service and commission everything that we do. So let's talk a bit about dew points. Dew point is the temperature at which a gas changes phase to a liquid or where the first drop of liquid would drop out of a gas if it cools off. So of course we see it all the time, right? We see it in the summer days or in spring days where, you know, as it gets cool at night or when we wake up in the morning, we see dew all over the grass. And it really happens because the air has held a certain amount of water vapor while it was a warm day. And then as things cooled off overnight, the air cools and we drop below the dew point temperature and water condenses out. And so we see those pretty spider webs with little drops of water hanging from them or drops of get grass that's damp and wet. And, uh, and when that dew point occurs is dependent on the pressure of the gas, on the nature of the gas or its chemical composition, on what things could be uh, uh, condensing out. And it differs a little bit for how things work when there's a single component like water or multiple components that can condense out like hydrocarbons. We, um, we end up with, uh, when things are immiscible, like if water is gonna condense out, it's not really affected by the fact there's a lot of other hydrocarbons in the background. But when we have something like hydrocarbons where there's pentanes, propane, or pentanes, hexanes, heptanes, heavier hydrocarbons, they all uh, start to contribute to that dew point. They each have a propensity to want to condense and the dew point occurs when the temperature gets that a low enough that a liquid can actually form. We're going to talk a bit about phase diagrams in a couple of minutes. You know, although we see it Normally in our day-to-day -day life, like I say with, you know, things like dew on grass and things like that, where it becomes really important to us is in things like gas processing facilities, natural gas transmission lines, any gas phase application with process analyzers, we concern ourselves with, do we allow liquids to condense out someplace? And so having a good understanding of dew points and why things condense is important to us both for particular applications like in the natural gas industry, but also everywhere through we're going about um, designing process analyzer sample systems. When I teach this course on sample systems, we spend a fair bit of time talking about why do things condense? What are the criteria under which they will condense? But when we talk about natural gas, we're looking at processing type applications for natural gas, it's both the water and the hydrocarbon dew point that impact performance of our systems. You'll often hear reference to phase diagrams and there's a number of different types of phase diagrams. But one of the common ones that we like to look at and that we refer to are we're often called P and T diagrams or pressure and temperature. Pressure on the Y axis, temperature on the X axis. And what we can put on these phase diagrams are curves which give us information about when phase changes are likely to happen or going to happen. So it kind of makes sense that if our temperature is hot and our pressure is low, our systems are primarily gas. So if the pressure is high, our pressure is low, temperature is high enough, we can get everything up into the gas phase. Of course, we boil water. What we do, we take the temperature up. If we uh, lower the pressure on the system, bring it under vacuum, we get bubbles starting to form because things want to go into the gas phase. And so at high temperatures and low pressures will be gas phase. If we take that gas at a given pressure and start to cool it, eventually we can get to the point where condensation occurs. And this is what we would refer to as the dew point temperature. At that pressure, 
if we try to take the temperature of that gas below where this curve is saying, so that things are going to condense there. And of course, if we take it further, we go through the liquid phase, we can end up freezing things. So phase diagrams give us information about how things are going to change or behave in terms of whether they're going to be gases, liquids, or solids. What we're looking at here is the phase diagram for a pure species. Um, so things like pure water or a pure, say, hexane sa uh, sample. When we have mixtures, the phase diagram gets a little bit more complicated. It gets more complicated because some components of the, of the mixture may want to condense out as a liquid, but other ones want to stay up in the gas phase. And so what we end up with when we look at something like natural gas, which is this complex mixture, you know, if we're looking at something like natural gas, we'll have, you know, a lot of methane, C1 hydrocarbons. We're going to have ethane, propane, all the way up to perhaps C12 hydrocarbons. Plus, we're going to have water. Plus, we're going to have things like CO2 and H2S. So we have a lot of different chemicals, and each one of them is going to exhibit different phase behavior at different temperatures. So we have to look at how that impacts the whole mixture. When we get to something like natural gas, we'll see a phase diagram which may be shaped somewhat like this one. This one happens to be a, I look at some of these, and this one happens to be a pretty fat phase envelope. We'll have other mixtures if it's predominantly lighter hydrocarbons, the phase diagram may be tighter, less distance across it. But what this whole thing is trying to show us, there's a lot of information tied up here in this phase diagram. If we're making liquefied natural gas, we want to stay on this side of the phase diagram because this is the side where it's all liquid. So if we start to look at that, where do I what do I have to do to be there? I have to be at very high pressures or at very low temperatures. And so if I'm going to make LNG, you know, we talk, you see these big cryogenic plants, they're liquefying natural gas by getting it cold and putting it under pressure. If I want this to run through my pipeline, I'm going to have to stay at higher temperatures Or if I'm going to let it get cool, I'm going, to have, I'm going to have to keep my pressures low. So the phase diagram starts to tell us where do I need to be if I want to be gas or if I want to be liquids. If I'm on this side of the phase envelope, I'm going to be gas. If I'm on this side of the phase envelope, I'm going to be liquid. If I'm up here, I'm going to be something called a supercritical fluid. Um, and we're going to avoid talking about that unless anybody has any particular questions about it. Where we're more really interested from, from, at least from the measurement of dew point, we're really interested a lot of times in this idea of how do I measure dew points in my natural gas? And so the dew point is going to be, if I have any particular pressure, let's say the pressure in my pipeline is 400 PSI. If I have any particular pressure, if I go across this phase envelope, I can look at where it touches that curve and it tells me, that looks like it's about 40 degrees F. It tells me the dew point of that gas, would, the hydrocarbon dew point would occur at about 40 degrees F. But based on its water content, you see there's this other curve in here that's shown for water. We have two chemicals or two different types of chemicals that can condense out of this natural gas. We're going to have hydrocarbons that condense out, or we're going to have water that condenses out. And in this case, the water dew point looks like it's more like 10 degrees F. So when we have a natural gas pipeline or a gas processing plant, a lot of the equipment that we have there wants that stuff to stay up in the gas phase. We start to get liquids forming in our pipelines. It can start to choke off flow a bit because it takes up some of the volume. It, if it's water, it can contribute to cor uh, corrosion. 
It can contribute to the forms of formation of things like gas hydrates and freezing off lines. And so we want to understand this phase diagram. This is a really big deal for chemical engineers. Guys are looking at plant designs. Um, they want to really try to understand this phase diagram to understand, well, am I going to make sure that every place that this fluid moves through my processing plant, it moves through as the phase that I want it to be. You'll hear terms like cricondin therms. Usually there should be marked on here someplace. Also the cricondin bar. The cricondin therm is the highest hydrocarbon dew point temperature. So the highest hydrocarbon dew point that you're going to achieve, and that happens at a particular pressure. So in the case for the gas shown on this phase envelope, it happens right around that 400 PSI I chose, like about 425 PSI or so. So at that pressure, you'll get the highest dew point temperature. It's important to understand that too, because if our natural gas pipeline is let's say operating up here closer to 900 PSI, we might say, well, our hydrocarbon dew point is only about 20 degrees F. But any place where the pressure gets let down in the transmission system, wherever that pressure drop happens, there's a potential, if the pressure was to drop down to here, all of a sudden we'd be two-phase. We'd have some hydrocarbons condensing out. So phase diagrams let us look at the impact of any pressure where temperature change is going to happen in the system and assess whether we're going to manage to stay single phase or whether we might go two phase. So when you hear the expression, when people start to talk about things like two phase flow, it means that they're in this part of the phase envelope where it's not entirely gas and it's not entirely liquids. When we're talking about natural gas, the water dew point is uh, important to us. The water dew point is be that temperature at which the first drops of liquid water form. And it depends almost entirely on the water concentrations and the pressure. It's not impacted that as much by changes in the hydrocarbon composition as things like the hydrocarbon dew point is. And so again, you know, looking at this previous chart, let's take my ink off of here for a second. Um, this curve right here is the one that's telling us this is the temperature. If I know my pressure was 1,000 PSI, I can say, well, if I get this stream below 45 degrees F, that's where I'm going to cross from the gas phase over to this side, and that's where my first drop of water is going to come out. That's going to be my water dew point. It's an important quality specification for us on natural gas, often enforced in Canada, at least in North America, as concentration, although Europe tends to enforce it as dew point. It's really dew point that's important to us. What's important to us is, is my stream going to get so cool or at such high of pressure that I'm going to have water start condensing out? And there's a number of reasons that we're concerned about that. One is that um, metals often won't undergo much, as much corrosion or will undergo go little corrosion when the water is all up in the vapor phase. But if we start to get pools or droplets of liquid water, it becomes a place for things like chlorides and sulfides to dissolve into and start to really contribute to corrosion of metals. The other thing that's really important though, is we can take species like methane, the common constituent of natural gas and water and take it down to a low temperature. And we form things called clathrates. Here where I can have my form. We form things called clathrates. Um, people also call them gas hydrates. They are, it's like an ice that's formed that's a mixture of the hydrocarbon and the water. And this can plug off valves, it can plug off entire pipelines. So the water dew point is a very important uh, feature for us 
from this corrosion perspective and also from its impact on potentially forming hydrates. On the hydrocarbon dew point again, side of things again, again, this is a temperature now at which the first hydrocarbons uh, condense out. It's gonna depend a lot on the pressure and a lot on the composition, particularly on the composition of heavier components. So people will try to calculate a dew point based on a, say a gas chromatograph result. Um, but oftentimes, you know, a GC will often only be getting a C1 through C6 plus number. And this is not enough detail to really try to figure out the dew point. Even a C9 plus makes it tough. It's the heavier hydrocarbons that are there. The C8, C9, C10, C11s, uh, these are the things that often are contributing to our dew points. So even we kind of try to show that in this figure at the bottom over here. Let me zoom on that for a second. And what this is showing is a phase diagram for you know, what would be considered a natural gas type application, but under three different sort of parts of the application. At the wellhead, where we've just done some initial drying, let's say with a, a, a glycol dehydrator, we can end up uh, moving, trying to move that sample out over to a plant and have dew points that are high up in that 70 degree F kind of range. Sorry, the pictures I stole off the internet were all in F, so for my all those metric people, you just have to convert it in your head. Um, you know, 70 F around uh, 25 degrees, 20 degrees C. When we get to the pipeline conditions and we've done some gas processing, we pulled out a lot of the heavier hydrocarbons. We said, geez, I want to sell that butane and pentane and hexane as liquids. So we've tended to pull the heavier hydrocarbons out. And now we can end up with a dew point around five degrees F. If we start to take something like LNG and uh, revaporize it, the dew points are going to be down in the minus 50 and minus 100 kind of range because we've done so much processing and pulled out so much of the heavier material. So the hydrocarbon dew point can be quite variable throughout the processes in a plant. And we want to be aware of that because, again, depending on the fluid we're going to bring into, we're measuring on quite a bit different ranges. Trying to measure on the lower ranges is often more difficult because a lot more um, sample conditioning things can impact our measurement. So it becomes really difficult to calculate the dew point based on GC analysis because often we just don't have enough data. Unless we get our analysis right out to C12, C15s, we're gonna have a difficult time trying to get a good estimate of that dew point. Again, the issues that we could end up seeing is liquid pooling in pipelines. Liquids starting to pool in systems because the dew point temperature, because the temperature has gotten so low or the pressure has gotten so high that we've moved into this two phase region. So on the feed lines coming into a plant, to a plant's inlet separator, you know, this will often be more like this wellhead gas and it often is in two phase flow with slugs of liquids coming over. So we have inlet slug catchers and all those sorts of things. Again, this is an important quality specification on natural gas, not only for how it affects the pipeline operations, but how it affects the things that are gonna to try to burn that fuel. So if we have uh, an industrial burner, a steam generator, a gas turbine, the amount of air we want to put in it. The last webinar we did was about, um, we'll be in there two webinars ago, I think was about we'll be index analyzers, trying to look at fuel quality and how much air do I need to put into it? Well, if our natural gas changes composition, if it, the do, hydrocarbon dew point gets too high, we have a lot of potential liquids mixed in with our gas, it needs a lot more air to burn properly. And so, we may have issues with burner control, some really rich burns, if we're looking at something like a steam generator. And there's been issues of things where the liquid droplets on the inlet to something like a gas turbine has caused flashback or burning back down the inlet lines. Because they pre-mix some air with fuel, there's, there's liquid droplets there, 
when that fuel first burns and there's liquid droplets and air there, it can flash back along the inlet lines. And so hydrocarbons dew points are important to us from a safety perspective as well. Again, on the pipeline side of things, you know, we also have to worry about this thing like temperature changes. If we've got a pipeline and let's say we go underneath a riverbed or we go in a place where um, there can be a significant change in ambient temperature, we can hit hydrocarbon dew points as we change those ambient temperatures. So when we look at dew point determination, there's a number of reasons that kind of drive it. Operationally, you know, again, gas phase pumps don't tend to like to push liquids through them. So operationally, things like pumps don't like it if we get liquid droplets in them. If we have liquids in our pipelines, it can lead to uncertainty in flow measurements. Um, you know, I was talking again on my sample system course about how if I have one milliliter of liquid, that would expand to being about 300 milliliters of gas. So if I've got some liquids condense out, and I don't measure them with my gas phase flow meter, I'm underestimating the flow that's going on in my pipeline. The liquids that condense out in pipelines tend to want to build up on the walls. And so as a result of that, um, we can often end up uh, we can often end up with uh, those liquids forming on the walls plugging on the walls, and that will end up, whoops, I just hit the wrong button. Sorry. If we end up with liquids forming on the walls, it'll end up also taking out some particulate, gets really thick and viscous, starts to build up a coating on the walls, pinching down the lines. For us, you know, how much flow we can put through a natural gas pipeline is important. So if we've got liquids built up on the walls, it constricts our gas flow. And now we have a lot of difficulties getting enough fluid to, or enough flow through the system, and we end up picking up the lines trying to clean them. From a safety perspective, as we mentioned, this can form hydrates. Um, hydrates can plug entire lines, get a big block of light, ice in there and a lot of pressure behind it. You have a potentially dangerous situation. Um, again, you have reduced and restricted flow as well as pressure buildups. There's external conditions that are impacting this as well. When we look at what's going on a lot in North America, certainly, we're seeing a lot of shale gas come online. And this tends to be a wetter gas, tends to have a lot more heavies. For guys who are up in the Montney, um, it's a really heavy hydrocarbon rich stream we produce up there because it produces a lot of natural gas liquids with it it means we have potential for a lot more hydrocarbon liquids in the gas. The other external thing is we have a lot more gas turbines out there and turbines don't like to see the system hit a hydrocarbon dew point and get liquids coming into them. So again, you know, because it changes in how we're using gas and the types of gas we're trying to produce, we have changes in why there's more interest in getting dew point determinations. Both the water and the hydrocarbon dew point is part of the custody transfer agreements, part of the tariffs. And so we want to be aware of those. If I'm selling gas to Scott, I have a certain set of specifications I have to meet up to. And that includes my water and my hydrocarbon dew point. If I drop out the heavies, they take a lot of BTU with them. The heavier the hydrocarbons, the more BTU value. So losing that milliliter of liquid that took a whole bunch of heavy hydrocarbons out of my system, I lost a lot of BTU value. So there's a bunch of good reasons for wanting to know these things. You would think that since we've been processing gas for a long time, we'd be, have a good handle on this and we'd understand why liquids are created in our system and what we need to do about it. But there's a lot of events that can happen either while we're sampling or while we're uh, producing or move, flowing down a pipeline that can impact what the dew point is. So these liquids can be formed operationally, like during plant operations, they can occur during the transport during the in the pipeline, and they can occur during sampling. 
we want to also look at how we sample and use things like appropriate probes, sample off the pipe wall, be away from where things are going to condense. Using the right type of way to extract the sample will it help uh, or it can impact how much insulation risk we're going to have. The common reasons we see liquids showing up in our system is either because there's been additional compression, we've increased the pressure, talk about that on the next slide. Um, they can also happen because we've reduced the pressure. Depending on the shape of that phase envelope, it can cause us to hit a hydrocarbon dew point. The common one is temperature. One of the com very common ones is temperature reduction. So if we hit a cold spot anywhere in the system, um, gas doesn't have a lot of heat capacity. So if we have a heat traced line, but then we have a break in the line where there's no heat tracing, we can lose a lot of temperature in just a few inches of exposed line. Same with things like probes. Probes have to be insulated and heated. Otherwise, they're gonna run at ambient temperatures. If there's places in the process pipe that runs at ambient temperature, that cold spot is going to control the dew point that we see. And then when we do let down pressure, when we do reduce the pressure, we also have to concern ourselves with a thing called the Joule Thompson effect. Sorry, there's no P in Joule Thompson. Um, or adiabatic cooling. And so when we, if gases were really ideal, we wouldn't have to worry about this. The Joule Thompson effect comes out of because of the non-ideality of the gases. And when we get a pressure reduction, it can contribute to lowering the temperature. So our reasons for hitting dew point, increasing pressure. If we look at the way that phase diagram looked, if we start out at some low pressure and we increase our pressure, as we do that, we can end up into this region. And again, the inside of the belly of this, that's the two phase region. So as we increase our pressure, we can end up in a region where we've hit the hydrocarbon dew point, or in this case, if we increase it higher, we could end up in a region where we hit a water dew point. So anytime we can apply compression to the system, whether it's a sample pump for an analyzer, whether it's a process pump, whether the gas came from a low pressure wellhead like casing gas, and we've decided to compress it to push it into a gas plant, all of those times we can end up suddenly hitting a dew point where we didn't have one before. So we may come up and say, geez, our casing grass, gas is dry. It's got a 70 degree F dew point, because it's way out here, you know. So our, our casing gas is, sorry, is at low pressure. Sorry, so it's got a, our casing gas is down here. It's at low pressure, uh, so it's got a low dew point. But as soon as I start to increase the pressure, now all of a sudden I move my way up into that uh, two-phase region, and I get, I get liquids occurring because I've compressed the gas. Similarly, if I start out at high pressures, you know, a lot of our gas pipelines now will be running at somewhere like, you know, 60 bar, 900 PSI. And that may have a sitting way up here in terms of the phase diagram. And if we drop the pressure down, perhaps because we have a pressure drop during transportation, because we went up from our 900 pound pipeline into a lower pressure pipeline, because we're bringing it into a gas distribution city, uh, system at a town or a city, anytime we lower the pressure on the process piping, we're going to potentially go through and hit a new dew point. So again, we want to be aware. It's interesting that you know, when I teach these courses on sample systems, I tell people you have to be aware of every place that the pressure and the temperature changes. But the same thing's true in all of my processing vessels, all of my pipelines. If I have a pressure or a temperature change, I can potentially hit a dew point. When I'm sampling for my analyzers, a lot of the analyzers out there work at lower pressures. Things like these diode laser type analyzers um, or um, um, the ceramic type sensor type analyzers can often be at lower pressures. And so they'll have a regulator in there. And as soon as they start to do that pressure reduction, if they start out with a gas like this, it will have to have been heated up first before that pressure reduction can happen. 
They don't do that. They're going to go through that two-phase region. And once they do that, we no longer get a representative sample. As soon as we've allowed condensation to occur, or if we've allowed the gas to flow over a place where condensation has occurred, we no longer get a representative sample. So we can often see this uh, pressure reduction happening and sample preparation for an analyzer. We have to be really careful about how that gets done. The other thing that we have to concern ourselves is if we uh, if we uh, cool, allow the temperature to drop. Anytime that there becomes a cold surface anywhere, it becomes the place that's going to control the dew point. If the dew point was higher than that, if I'm flowing down a pipe and the temperature over here is whatever, 20 degrees C, and my dew point is 10 degrees C. And then I take this, and this happened to be underground, and I bring it up and above ground. Sorry, awful drawing. I don't print well, and my art's even worse. Let's say the gas, it goes out to an exposed pipe now that's at zero degrees C. As soon as it cools down and goes through that zero degrees C pipe, it's going to start to condense out liquids in here. The dew point was 10 degrees C. It hit that cold spot. So now it condenses out liquids. Even if this pipe now goes back underground, it heats up or whatever, it's back up to 20 degrees C, we pull a sample from here. We can never measure the original 10 degrees C dew point because it went past this cold spot that cooled it to zero degrees C. The opposite can happen too. If there's a warm spot, if there's a place that has condensed liquids and that liquid is warm, when the gas flows over it, it picks up as much water vapors or hydrocarbon vapors as it can. And that starts to control the dew point we can measure. If there's a patch, if there's a low spot that has condensed liquids in it and we flow over top of it, we pick up any liquids that are there and bring them up into the gas phase and bring them over to the analyzer so we can get an abnormally high dew point. So decreasing temperature will cause us to hit a dew point. Having liquids present in a warm spot will cause us to read too high of a dew point. So on operations, if we have any cold surfaces, we have wellhead gas coming out to a cold wellhead pump or something like that, ambient temperature changes on pipelines, all of these are gonna affect whether we hit a dew point or not. What we're doing in these cases is going from here on the vapor side of the phase diagram and moving as we cool it down at constant pressure into that two phase region again. So in this case, we'd hit the hydrocarbon dew point first and then the water dew point. When we're gonna sample these, we have to make sure our probes are heated. You often see people put in heat trace lines, but not put heating on the probe. Well, when I have a pipe nozzle and I have a probe that's sticking through there and coming out like this, and then I have my heat trace line over here, this temperature starts to control my dew point. If it's cold, it's going to condense things out. If things cold things condensed in the nighttime and the day warms up, then as the probe warms up, it starts to release water vapor. And I start to read too high of a dew point. So when I have things like cold or poor temperature control anywhere in my sample system is potentially gonna impact my dew point. Even if I go out and I put all my sample cylinders, I'm gonna pull samples in, I'm gonna pull samples for the lab, and I allow my cylinders to sit in the back of my truck, and they get cold, and they go pull a sample. Well, because the cylinder's cold, it condenses liquids in it, and it biases my sample. So any place where the temperature drops, I potentially hit a dew point. And again, that can cause bias in measurement and can cause problems in how we process that fluid, whether in a pipeline or in a plant. Finally, there's a the combined effect, the Joule-Thompson effect. And the JT effect essentially just says that whenever we have a pressure reduction, so anytime I go across something like a needle valve 
where I go across a regulator, anytime I take that pressure reduction, there's also gonna be a delta T across there. It's gonna cool as the pressure reduction happens. For natural gas, it cools by about 5.6 degrees C per megapascal, 0 0.56 degrees C for 100, every 100 kPa, 3.9 degrees C if you're using it for 100 PSI drop. For my American friends here, that's about seven degrees F for every 100 PSI. So depending on how much pressure drop I have, it's gonna impact how much temperature change I'm gonna have. If I drop by 600 PSI, I'm gonna cool by about 42 degrees F. Or with 24 degrees C. So when I have that pressure drop happen, I think that, well, I'm just dropping the pressure. I'm gonna go down like that. I'm gonna be fine. I'm all on the gas phase side over here. Because it, I get the joule thompson effect, which causes cooling across the regulator during the pressure drop, I actually move where I am on the phase diagram and I get back into that two-phase region. This is really common at regulators for analyzers. Gonna think though, if we go running a gas pipeline and we're doing gas compression, we have a great big turbine engine there that we run off natural gas and we regulate the pressure to go into that turbine. So we can get that Joule Thompson effect causing the gas to cool and causing phase change as we go across the regulator as well. So we wanna just make sure that you understand why it is that we hit dew points in systems. It's one of these several effects. And each time that happens, depending on where it is, it may cause poor analyzer results. It may cause problems with gas transmission. It may cause problem with plant operations, it may cause our pumps to fail. So we have to be aware that hitting dew points in our processing facilities causes us operational issues and hitting dew points in analyzers causes us measurement issues. All right. So because it can cause so many issues, that's why we'd like to be able to measure it. And uh, one of the ways we can measure that is, is with an analyzer that's manufactured by Z-Gas Instruments. And it has some unique features. It measures everything at line pressure. So this is important to us because one of the first things we, we said is that you know, when we drop the pressure, we can cause ourselves issues. So if we measure at line pressures, we're gonna be less likely to have phase change. Sorry, I just saw something come up in the chat here. Oh, yeah, hi Lee. Yeah, aluminum oxide, I think is the most common one for those capacitive type sensors. Um, so, so measuring at line pressure lets us, mitigates that issue that we were concerned about, about when we drop the pressure, things may cool and we may hit a dew point. One of the other unique things about the Z-Gas instrument is that it can measure the water dew point and the hydrocarbon dew point simultaneously on the same device using the same technology. So oftentimes if people are gonna to try to do this, they'll either use two completely different technologies. They might measure the water with aluminum oxide and try to do chill mirror for the hydrocarbon or some other combination of techniques. The Z-Gas product um, is capable of doing both the water and the hydrocarbon dew, uh, dew points simultaneously. And it does it by effectively a chilled mirror technique, which is the sort of the accepted standard, if you like, for measuring dew point. It's a true dew point measurement. A lot of other things will measure concentration and from that and say, I'll try to estimate what the dew point is. This is actually cooling the surface down and waiting until the first drop of liquid shows up. They use a spectroscopic technology called SEERS. We're gonna talk about that over the next few slides, which lets us unambiguously determine whether it's a water or a hydrocarbon dew point, and also allows us to reject some other things that we might find, like glycols or methanol. No moving parts, so low maintenance, 
And we can typically get to an accuracy of about half a degree C on that dew point measurement. The other thing from a hazardous area perspective, especially for up here in Canada, US puts a lot of class one div two analyzers in on pipelines. A lot of times up here we're class one div one, class one zone one. Um, and so this is available for a, in a div one package. So the Sears technology, interesting was Hydrocarbon Processing Magazine had a 2020 uh, awards going on and the Sears technology was in there as one of the finalists for the natural gas technology. Um, Sears is a, an accurate first principles measurement. So by first principles, when we, um, when we make a measurement by something that is actually directly measuring that property, so if I measure the concentration of a gas by how much ultraviolet uh, light it absorbs, it's not really a first principles measurement because there's other things that can affect that absorption. When I do the measurement by, of something by the way that it actually determines what happens, so in this case, I chill a mirror until stuff condenses on it, I measure the concentration, well, that's actually the definition of dew point. So dew point really is. So it's a chilled mirror or a chilled surface type technology. It's exactly like what is done in the Bureau of Mines standard. You know, what people often see with the Chandler devices. Uh, cool on the surface, look for condensation to happen. The difference is they use a thermoelectric cooler instead of using the um, refrigerant and it allows them, the other difference is the spectroscopy side of it allows them the difference between the water and the hydrocarbon dew point. They don't use a metallic surface so it doesn't corrode. The surface is a glass-like material, highly polished so things don't stick to it easily, and they cool that glass-like material down and look for condensation of liquid on the surface. They do that, I try to show it a little bit schematically here and I'll show it on the next slide as well. They do that by using the E part of this, what's called an evanescent wave. And so you probably notice that sometimes when you look at a clear window, you see your reflection in it. And it's because some of the light bounces off the window. And if we hit an optical surface at the appropriate angle, we can get what's called total internal reflection, Bragg scat or Bragg reflection, total internal reflection. And so the light bounces back off the surface. And it does that because there's a change in refractive index at the surface. So the only way it knows that there's a change in refractive index on the surface is it has to try to get out first. It says like, I'm in jail inside this crystal. I'm gonna see if I can get out. Nope wrong refractive index out there, I gotta bounce back in. So the light wave that's coming in goes through the crystal, out into the material above it, which may be our gas sample. And that piece that goes out into the material above it is called an evanescent wave. Goes out of the material, says, oh, wrong refractive index out there, I gotta bounce back in. And so, the technology that's used in the Z-gas instrument is they chill the crystal down, they let that evanescent wave go out, they use infrared light, and by using different wavelengths of infrared light, they can detect whether there's hydrogen or carbon molecular bonds on the surface or whether there's OH bonds, water. So that lets them determine if there's a liquid on the surface, is that liquid water or is that liquid hydrocarbons? A couple of the advantages of this, it means that the light beam that we're using, other devices try to shine a beam of light to the gas and reflect off of the surface. So if there's dirt particulate and trained mist in the gas, it will scatter the light and give you false readings. We don't have the, the Sears technology doesn't actually ever go out really into the gas. It's not part of the measurement. The beam only goes out a couple of microns into the, uh, out of the surface and then bounces back in again. And if there's a liquid there, the 
liquid layer on the surface, the beam changes its properties. It loses some intensity. So schematically, we're going to try to show what goes on here. So what I'm trying to show here is that I have infrared light at two different colors I'm showing here. The actual device may use more than two, but we're going to show it as being two. I've got infrared light coming on two different colors, and it shines out, flow, goes through the crystal, hits the surface and goes out just a little bit, comes back in, bounces off a reflective surface, and so it can go out of there a few times. And eventually, it makes its way over to a detector. Schematically, I'm showing red is the one that picks up hydrocarbons, and purple is the one that picks up water vapor, or water, liquid water. So now I just allow my sample of gas to flow past this thing, and I cool the crystal. So that blue dotted line is representing the temperature of the crystal dropping. It's getting the crystal colder and colder, and if nothing condenses on the surface, the amount of signal I'm seeing on my detectors doesn't change. It says, oh, I went out and bounced gas out there. Sorry, can't do anything. Coming back in, goes back to the detector. Nothing changes. But now if I hit the hydrocarbon dew point, now if I hit the hydrocarbon dew point, he says again, if I hit the hydrocarbon dew point, what happens is the color of light that's detecting hydrocarbon suddenly gets absorbed by this liquid layer on here. So I'm trying to show this as this little layer of brown fluid that's sitting on the surface. Um, that's my liquid layer of hydrocarbon suddenly on the surface. And now the light that's touching it, that evanescent wave goes through the liquid hydrocarbons and the, some of the hydrocarbons absorbs that light. So my signal drops. I take the temperature at which that signal uh, dropped at and I say, that's my hydrocarbon dew point temperature. So I'm measuring the temperature all the way through. When I see the signal drop on the hydrocarbon wavelength, I say, oh, I just hit my hydrocarbon dew point. I continue cooling the crystal. Suddenly, I see the signal on the water wavelengths drop. Now I know I've just hit my water dew point. So once I've done that, once I've hit both of the dew points, well, now I can stop cooling and let the system heat back up again and get ready for my next measurement. So the important thing here is to realize is that we have this crystal, we have the light bouncing through it. And as long as there's not a, a liquid layer on the surface, the light doesn't get attenuated. When a hydrocarbon layer like this brown one shows up, sorry, or a water layer like this blue one shows up, when they show up on the surface, they start to attenuate the light. And that gives us the trigger to say that temperature that the crystal's at, that's where things start to condense now. Once I've measured both dew points, I can let the crystal heat back up again. And then I can get ready to do my next measurement. Once it's back up to temperature, all my signals are back, I can start to prepare to cool it again. So basically the way this works is uh, the evanescent waves always going out there to interrogate what's on the other side of the crystal. Most of the time it says, I'm just gas and bouncing back. So the crystal cools, we measure the light con continuously. The evanescent wave asks, what's on the surface right now? Doesn't see anything, we don't get any change in signal. Condensation occurs, the properties of the evanescent wave changes, gets attenuated, the signal drops. We use two different or multiple wavelengths to say, I can tell the difference between hydrocarbons and water. I only penetrate a small way out so I don't get affected by what change is happening in the gas, only by what's condensing on the surface. And I measure the actual dew point because I measure when does liquid condense on the surface. So that's the big advantage of Sears. Measures the actual dew point. Hydrocarbons are different than water and we're measuring the actual temperature. Hey, Phil. Mm -hmm. Brian's, asking, Brian's asking, with temperature being a fairly slow process, what is the cycle time between the readings? Question. So 
it depends somewhat on how cold the dew point we have to hit is. The more we have to cool it down or the deeper we have to cool it, the longer it's going to take. If the dew point is fairly close to where it's starting out at, so if I might, if my, was starting out at 20 and my dew points all happened at five, well, I only have to cool down to five and I can warm back up again. So typical cycle times you're going to see are on the order of three to six minutes. So or Miriam may have a better answer to that, but I mean, I think that's what we've typically seen in applications. And you can set the amount of time you want to leave the system to warm back up again um, before the next reading. Yeah, uh, just, just to add to that, uh, Phil is exactly right. It depends on, uh, you know, what, what the gas temperature is that you're starting at and uh, what the dew point is. Just like any other refrigeration system, you're trying to cool a certain amount of degrees and the more you have to cool, the longer it's going to take. But uh, typically, you know, at some of our units are used at wellhead to measure moisture at wellhead. That happens within 30 seconds or so. Uh, when you're looking at pipeline quality gas where hydrocarbon or moisture dew point are, you know, around minus five or minus 10 Celsius, you're looking at more like four to six minutes. Yeah, it's an application dependent somewhat, but in that sort of, it's measured in minutes typically, I guess. It's, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you happen to see, yeah, okay. yeah. Allison has a question in the yeah. chat there. If there's wax and acetine that's stuck in the pipe surface, what would the impact to, would that impact the reading? If it's in the pipe surfaces, I, I mean, I guess again, like if you have, that's a good question really, I got think, and it's in that, if it's waxy and low vapor pressure, it's probably not much of an issue, right? But anything I've got on my surface, whether it's water or hydrocarbons, anything I've got on the surface is trying to come off that surface and exhibit some vapor pressure as well. It has a certain partial pressure. And so, you know, potentially, I don't know about asphaltines, I wouldn't worry about the partial pressure of, but Depending if I add like a high molecular weight hydrocarbon, like a C10, C11, aliphatic material, kind of like a wax, I would think that as that pipeline heats up, if you get a bunch of ambient heat come in, hot, sunny day, get a bunch of ambient heat, so change the temperature of the whole pipeline, you could potentially see that driving some materials off the surface if your pipelines uh, got that material. Sora, we can set how, what, oh, sorry. I was just yeah, going to say, Lee, yeah. did you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Brian, yeah, it's a Peltier type cooler. Um, and Sora, we can set the, um, how much we let it warm back up to before we start another cycle as well, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, there is yeah. a delay time that you can program. Yeah. Uh, that you know allows you to, uh, but you know the the question that uh, was just asked a moment ago. It's a really interesting question, in that we do see that in many pipelines, particularly down south, which shows that during warmer days, you see higher hydrocarbon and water dew point, and during colder nights, you see lower dew points, and that specifically relates back to this phenomena you were just talking about, is that if you have let's say some pool of liquid in the pipeline on the walls or wherever, uh, if the pipe temperature gets warm, more of that liquid, whether it's water or hydrocarbon, more of that liquid uh, makes it into the gas phase, will get sampled by the probe. And the analyzer basically analyzes what reaches it. And when it sees a re richer um, you know, stream reaching it, it shows higher dew point, whether it's for hydrocarbon or water. And then when the temperature of the pipe falls down and more of that vapor goes back into the liquid phase, you see the same phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, and it's the same, it's, you know, we do a thing, or if, when I'm teaching some of my classes, we talk about how, you know, if you have a cold spot in a sample system where a place where condensation happens, it can end up being that you turn your elaborate expensive analyzer into a really fancy thermometer. It tells you the temperature of your cold spot. Right, because that's what's controlling the dew point or the condensation of whatever is condensing. 
Yeah, and so the question from Lee was, if your dew point is normally a minus 20, can you tell it to start at minus 10 instead of plus 10? And you can, you can set how long you allow it to warm up before it starts the next cycle. And so that can help you sort of tune that, that response time, if you like. Yes, and I, um, I, I, I do have a slide, which if interested at the end, I'll show it to you, but we collected some long-term data from quite a few of our customers uh, that actually exactly shows the cyclical behavior between day and night. And they, mm -hmm. that typically corresponds to places where the pipe has some fluid in it already. Yeah. Uh, places where the uh, pipeline is pristine and there's nothing in it doesn't show the same uh, fluctuation. Yeah, we used to see it too on H2S analyzers with adsorption on surfaces. And you'd be in some place like Texas and the sun would come around a certain frack tower. Um, and once it hits, gets around the frack tower and the lines start to heat up, all of a sudden the H2S concentrations would all go up. The crystal is in a sealed unit, but you can usually, or the the more common forms of contamination are things like you've got something like compressor oil or something like that over to it. And so there's a port that you can run either something like high purity propane through it or high purity butane through it and clean, rinse the crystal off and then let all that stuff flash back off again. So yeah, you can clean it without um, taking the whole unit apart. It's really a matter of flushing it with an appropriate solvent to get rid of the thing you're trying to get rid of. Yes, and with the standard sample system, there are a couple of liquid filters up front mm -hmm. uh, to try to catch, you know, liquid droplets that may ingress into the analyzer, and they try to catch it. And there are drains that would uh, drain that liquid out to protect the analyzer. The only time you would really see a problem is uh, if you don't change those filters or if they get ruptured over time. But with routine maintenance, you're not going to see any contamination because. One of, one of the interesting things that happens is that every time you have a hydrocarbon dew point happen, you're basically condensing hexanes, mm -hmm. heptanes, octanes, you know, the heavy hydrocarbons, and they're really good solvents. So if you have some traces of heavier, uh, you know, oily, oily material, they usually get dissolved and they come out unless you have a major contamination event. And usually those don't happen if you do their, your routine maintenance by changing the filters. Right, unless you have a big process upset or something like that, and they throw a whole bunch of oil that overwhelms one of the uh, coalescers or something like that. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. So what Sora was mentioning is a typical sample system. It's like it's like he's my straight man for this slide. Um, in a typical sample system, we'll have usually two coalescing filters, a depth type coalescer and a membrane type coalescer before the analyzer, and those are there just to get rid of those. If there's any carryover of some heavy liquids, whether it be like droplets of amine or droplets of glycol or droplets of compressor oil, those are there to condense those out and separate those out from the, uh, from the stream before it actually goes into the analyzer. So, you know, typical installation will have the analyzer in Canada, a typical installation will have the analyzer in a heated and temperature controlled enclosure. So, you know, kind of, you know, heater down here, thermos, thermocouple here, temperature measurement here that's providing temperature control. Keep that whole cabinet at constant temperature. Typical applications we see these get used in natural gas processing, whether it's looking at trying to optimize dehydrators and cryo units, whether we're putting fluid to and from cavern storage. And so we know it was dry when it went in. We want to see how wet is it when it comes out. Um, It'll, any place where we want to do simultaneous water and hydrocarbon dew point measurements or individual ones. So, you know, we've talked about doing simultaneous all the time, but we can do this as a water only. We can do this as an HC only, or we can do it as a combined. Um, on natural gas pipelines, since there's a tariff on both water content and hydrocarbon dew point, um, we'd like to see, you know, a common application would be to measure both of those. When we get to things like turbines and boilers, there's concern about, do I put enough air in for the fuel that's coming in? 
And the heavier it is, the higher the dew point is, basically the more air we need. So if we have a high dew point stream, we have to concern ourselves, of, are we gonna put enough air in there? Or are we potentially, as we regulate that stream down, creating drops of liquid hydrocarbons that are again, then gonna cause problems for the burner? So we have you know, risks like flame outs, uh, damage, flashbacks, things like that. And then we just have poor combustion control as well. So we wanna be aware of that dew point. Um, Harvey's, good question. Um, I have specs coming up on the next page, so we'll talk about it there. No, two pages. Um, and then gas plant or chemical plants often are worried about their gas feed qualities. So again, we might, you know, this is a good application for these. Available as both a you know fixed installation. So US, you'll see them put things like that outside. Canada will typically put it inside of a heated enclosure. Also available as a portable. So if you want to do portable dew point testing, it can be done as well using the same technologies. I, Brian has another adds another question. I'm yep. just wondering if it's going to be addressed in two slides also. But he says, is the reading pressure compensated in the analyzer or is it not needed? When you're doing dew point, you don't have to do a pressure compensation, right? Because it's what temperature did the liquids condense out at. If you want to convert dew point back to parts per million, you have to do a pressure correction as well. Um, the only thing with hydrocarbon dew points in Europe, they like to do it at that cricondent therm, so they like to control the pressure before they get into the analyzer, so they measure the highest possible dew point. But if all you want is dew point, there's no need for a, an additional pressure correction. But the analyzer has an internal pressure sensor anyways and gives you the pressure reading. So um, so the, the, the other reason for the pressure sensor there in the, for the water function is that knowing the water dew point and knowing the pressure, it can tell you the PPM or right. pounds per million cubic feet. It can do that. It's already built into the software. Yeah, if you want to convert back to concentration, you've got to have a pressure and the dew point reading. So when you were asking about is the sample, if the sample systems enclosure is maintained at 50 degrees C, does the analyzer require external cooling? So if the gas coming in was at 50 degrees C, we can cool down to about by about 50 degrees C. So it would depend what dew point you're trying to measure, Harvey. If your dew point was zero degrees C or five degrees C and the enclosure was 50, you'd be able to do it without any additional um, uh, additional sample conditioning components, et cetera. I would think if you were trying to measure a lower dew point than that, I wouldn't necessarily... I don't know, I may have to leave this one to soar out, but I was thinking I could maybe get away with just cooling the gas before it went in, but it might so, be there's too much heat transfer from a hot analyzer. I have a mea culpa here. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, those numbers were from the first generation of instrument 10 years ago. Okay, now sorry. the depression is closer to 70 degrees, oh. um, uh, 70 Celsius and whatever that is in Fahrenheit. Uh, so it will apply. We do have units in heated enclosures that are maintained at 60 degrees. So those typically can go down to minus 10. Um, okay. So it is it is a um, higher depression. Basically, there is more power. There is a better, you know, revised thermal design. Those specs are a bit old, but uh, my uh, my uh, sort of my fault for not <laughs> sending. No, that's my me a couple. I probably read an old spec sheet. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thanks, Sarab. You can validate the reading on the analyzer. So good question again, how do you validate? On the hydrocarbon side, what we typically do is take something like high purity ethane. And because it's a pure compound, on its phase diagram, there's a unique dew point temperature. So if we know the pressure of the ethane that we're putting in, we know what dew point we should get. So you can have a curve that, you know, basically shows. If I had a 
curve where the pressure goes up. As the pressure goes up, I can correlate each of those pressures to a dew point temperature. And so if this is for something like pure ethane. And so if I know what pressure I am at, I can know, well, this is the dew point temperature I should get. So you can run that pure ethane sample and say, did I get that dew point temperature? On water, it requires some kind of a calibration standard, which is one of the difficult things. You know, when you're doing natural gas and you're talking about one pound per million cubic feet, um, that's only about 21 parts per million. And it's tough to get a good calibration standard for water. Put water in a cylinder, all the water vapor wants to stick to the metal surfaces. So you end up having to have heated cylinders, heated regulators that have fairly short lifetimes. So water at low levels can be more difficult. For hydrocarbons, again, we usually just compare it against a known pure compound. One of the interesting things regarding this unit, the dual unit, is that it is not really two separate sensors. It is mm -hmm. the same sensor. Basically, we're grabbing the spectrum and we're looking at what's, what's in that liquid. Uh, because of that, on the dual unit, if the hydrocarbon dew point is working, chances are 99.999% that the water dew point is also working correctly because it's the same temperature sensor, it's mm -hmm. the same spectral data, it's the same electronics. So, but for pure water instrument, the WDP 5000, yes, it's very difficult to come up with a, uh, with a known moisture standard that doesn't change over time and can, you know, can always produce the same moisture standard uh, routinely. So it is a little more difficult, but on yeah. the dual unit, if you validate with the hydrocarbon, the water function is also assured. Yeah, and so when we have one in the shop, we'll often, the other thing, like if it's not reading the hydrocarbons correctly, it's probably because there's uh, contamination and so often it'll lead to cleaning. Um, you know, when it's in a shop, you can do things like, you can buy moisture generators um, but field validation is a little bit more difficult. So we validate in the shop against basically an ice bath. So we say, well, we're going to flow through a bath at known temperature that we're going to ensure it's saturated at that temperature and see does it read the right water dew point then. Um, so typical dew point accuracy, half a degree C. CRNs for up to 2,000 PS, PSI for us Canadians. Systems are typically pressure tested up to 6,000. Communication protocols are available. You know, we can talk to it over RS45, over, over Ethernet, and of course, I have analog and digital I.O. So you see I'm running a little bit late, so I'll just hit my summary. The unique thing with the Z-Gas is this patented Sears technology that allows it to do both the water and the hydrocarbon dew point measurement. So first principle measurement is actual true dew point. And, you know, like we said, uh, actually about a half a degree C. Um, just quickly, uh, we're going to send you out a copy of all the slides. We put kind of a, uh, an overview of who Insight works with as far as product lines and what other things we do. So if there's, you know, we certainly like to get feedback from people of, hey, I'd love if you gave a talk about such and such. I think our next one coming up is going to be about Adam Scientific Total Sulfur Analyzers um, or Adam Instruments Total Sulfur Analyzers. Um, I always like to acknowledge everybody. So thank you all for attending. As we said, our gratitude should be going out to those people who are helping to keep us safe during these difficult times. Don't think I'm doing a webinar next week. I got a couple of company ones with people. So March 9th, I'm doing one on analyzer sample systems about coalescers. And March 11th is Atom Instruments and Total Sulfur Analyzers. And I'm gonna wrap it up there. I usually put up this little animation of of a bunch of the uh, systems we've done integration on. And certainly if there's any other questions, happy to take them now. If... if not, and we're all good, um, you will get an email out, uh, which has, I think a copy of all the slides from today. And uh, also a little bit about our line card as well and feel free to email back and uh, ask any questions if you like. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jeff.
Good seeing a bunch of people I know here. Thanks for coming, Brian, Lee, Zorab. Uh, God, there's a whole bunch on here. I can't even see all the names right now. So uh, again, thanks everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again.